our focus today is going to be on phases of matter and intermolecular forces. So we're kind of combining two topics that I know we've already had some pretty good discussions about in Chem 1, and we're going to expand on those a little bit in Chem 2 just to get a better understanding of how the different phases of matter and the molecules within them interact with one another and how that creates a variety of different chemical properties that we can observe within these different states of matter. I'm excited as you are. Let's get started. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to meet the learning objectives for today, which includes being able to explain the different phases of matter as well as phase changes. You should also be able to analyze molecules for intermolecular forces and then rationalize a variety of properties that are related due to the intermolecular forces which those particular molecules in those states of matter have. We've got a lot of different vocab terms for this. A lot of these you've already discussed in class. Things like all of the different phase changes that are on the left hand side here. We're also going to talk about condensed phases, freezing point, boiling point, London dispersion forces, dipole dipole forces, dipole induced dipole, ion dipole, and hydrogen bonding. So before we even begin with the intermolecular forces, I want to take some time and do a quick little review of the different states of matter that can exist. Now forms of matter can exist as either a solid, liquid, or a gas. Physical changes can occur between these states, things like melting, which takes a solid and converts it into a liquid, or vaporization, which takes that liquid and then converts it into a gas. Now all of these phase changes are based on the kinetic energy of the molecules. The higher the kinetic energy, the more likely it's going to be a gas. If the kinetic energy is low, it's more likely to be a solid. Remember that kinetic energy is directly related to molecular movement and temperature, which kind of makes sense because solids have a lower temperature than gases do. Now, remember that when we talk about solids, that molecular movement is vibratory. That means that those molecules vibrate in a fixed position within the molecule. There's definite shape and volume, high intermolecular forces because the molecules are very close together, low kinetic energy, they don't move, they just vibrate in place, and solids have a low ability to be compressed. That's because they're already packed tightly. Now, the phase change between solid and liquid is melting, and the phase change between liquid and solid is freezing. Again, things we're already pretty familiar with. When we look at liquids, molecular movement is molecules sliding against each other, so the movement's a little bit greater. Think about a shopping center on Thanksgiving Day, right, or at the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. You're moving around and you're, you're kind of bumping into each other and it, it's very, very tight space. So you're not just vibrating in a fixed position, but you're able to move, but it's still relatively tight. Liquids have a definite volume, but an indefinite shape, meaning that they take the shape of the container that they're in. They still have relatively strong intermolecular forces because they're relatively close together. They cannot be compressed. Kinetic energy is somewhere in between a solid and a gas. A couple more phase changes. A liquid to a gas is vaporization. That is, we're converting it into a vapor. And gas to liquid is known as condensation. So when we talk about gases, the key thing to keep in <coughs> excuse me, the key thing to keep in mind here is that molecular movement or the molecules are moving are rapidly moving atoms with very few collisions. So there are very few collisions in a gas. The reason being is that those molecules are so far apart that they very rarely interact with one another. That allows them to move much more rapidly and also allows them to move in straight lines. Gases have no definite volume or definite shape, which means that they have the ability to be compressed like a tank of propane. No, I will not make my Hank Hill propane joke at this point in time, as much as I may want to. There are no intermolecular forces that are present between the gas molecules because they are so far apart, and the kinetic energy is the highest. That is, the temperature is the highest, and there's more molecular movement. The last two phase changes we need to make sure that we understand are gas to solid, which is deposition, and solid to gas, which is sublimation. You saw this when I played with the carbon dioxide, the dry ice, earlier this year. So one last thing to keep in mind is that liquid and solid are considered condensed phases because the molecules touch each other. That means that both of these are going to exhibit somewhat similar properties, that is, high intermolecular forces. Gases are very, very far apart. That's not a condensed phase. They have a very low density. The particles are very far apart from one another, and they have very weak attraction and move very, very quickly. Right? Gases can be condensed. Condensed phases cannot be condensed anymore because they're already condensed. 
Speaking of intermolecular forces, intermolecular forces are forces that exist in between different molecules. Now, don't confuse this with intramolecular forces, which are things like ionic bonding and covalent bonding. Those are forces that exist within the same molecule. Intermolecular forces exist in between two or more different molecules. Now, these different intermolecular forces play a huge role in the properties that many of these molecules have. So what we're going to do is we're going to just talk about a variety of different forces in between these different molecules. And the first one we're going to start off with is the one that every single molecule has, and that is London dispersion forces. So you know that electrons exist around atoms, and they they exist in three-dimensional regions called orbitals, and we don't really know the locations of those electrons. They can exist in any one place at any time. Well, at any one time, you can get an instantaneous moment where all of the electrons are located on one side of the molecule, and there are very few electrons located on the other side. So what that tells you is that one side is going to be slightly more negative, and then the other side is going to be slightly more positive because, again, one area of the molecule has more electrons and the other area has fewer electrons. This creates a slight negative and positive charge on atoms or molecules which can attract each other if you remember from Coulomb's law. That's really, really important because the positive of one attracts the negative of the other. So there's electrostatic attraction between there. That creates a force of attraction between those two atoms or molecules. Now the key thing to keep in mind is that these dipoles are very, very temporary. What I mean by dipole is that there's a negative part on one and a positive part on the other. Again, they are temporary because those electrons are always in constant and random motion. So as soon as that dipole exists and the attraction occurs, they move back and the dipole no longer exists. So these forces are relatively weak. However, if the molecule is very, very large, London forces can actually add up. The larger the molecule, the more electrons, the, more, uh, the stronger the London dispersion interaction. The next intermolecular force we're going to look at is dipole-dipole forces. Now these are permanent dipoles. Remember that polar molecules all have permanent dipoles. They unevenly share electrons. So one atom in the molecule is going to be more negative than the other based on how many electrons it has near it. The negative of one is going to be attracted to the positive end of another molecule. <coughs> Excuse me. Now keep in mind that these molecules must be polar. All polar molecules will have some form of dipole-dipole interaction. The more polar the molecule is, the stronger the dipole-dipole interaction. So for example, HCl, the Cl has more electrons that are closer to it, therefore it is more negative, which would make the hydrogen more positive. The negative of one attracts the positive of another. Again, these molecules must be polar. A new intermolecular force that I know we haven't talked about before is dipole-induced dipole. Now this interaction occurs when a polar molecule is introduced to a nonpolar molecule or nonpolar substance. The dipole on the polar molecule actually can induce a dipole on the other due to the electrostatic attraction or repulsion. So if you take a look here, you have a water molecule that's induced into oxygen. Now oxygen is a nonpolar molecule, meaning that the sharing of electrons is even. The water molecule is polar. There's more electrons on the oxygen than the hydrogen. Well, having more electrons on that oxygen as it approaches the oxygen molecule, the electrons on the water actually repel the electrons to the opposite end of the oxygen, thus inducing a dipole. Because now in the oxygen molecule, the electrons on the oxygen are all on the left-hand side, whereas the positive end of the oxygen on the right side has very few electrons because as the water molecule approaches it, the electrons repel them. So when you introduce a polar substance into a nonpolar substance, you can actually induce dipoles in those nonpolar substances. Now, because we're inducing those dipoles, they're actually weaker than dipole-dipole interactions. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Another one we want to look at is ion-dipole interactions. And this is an intermolecular attraction due to an ion being introduced into a polar substance. The strength of this depends on the uh, this charge size and the type of charge that are present. So if you take a look here, we take sodium and we introduce it into water, right? Or sodium ions from salt. The sodium is a positive charge, so look at all the water molecules around it. The negative end of those water molecules is attractive to the positively charged sodium. So this is a fairly strong interaction. 
Chlorine, if it were introduced, you would have the opposite interaction. The hydrogens on water would be attracted to the chlorine because chlorine is negatively charged and the hydrogens are positively charged, thus resulting in an interaction. These can be fairly strong interactions and kind of what prevents salt molecules from reforming back together. Keep in mind that the magnitude of the charge as well indicates the strength of the interaction. So if we had magnesium, for example, magnesium is a stronger molecule. Magnesium has a plus two charge that's associated with it. So it's going to have a stronger interaction with those water molecules than say something with the plus one. The last one we want to look at is hydrogen bonding, and this is the strongest dipole-dipole interaction. It must be polar as well. Now this is really important to understand. The hydrogen of one atom that is covalently bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine is attracted to the oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine of another molecule. So not only does the hydrogen have to be covalently bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, but then it has to also be attracted to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine that is attached to a hydrogen. So this particular hydrogen bonding, this particular dipole-dipole interaction is very strong due to the large difference in electronegativity. That's why it has to be attached to a hox oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine is because the electronegativity differences between those uh, atoms has to be very, very strong in order for the dipole to be strong. Okay, so keep those in mind. Water conducts hydrogen bonding. You guys have talked to me a lot about that already. So what properties can we indicate from intermolecular forces? Well, the higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, right? Harder to break those molecules, so it requires more energy to do so. Higher the melting point, kind of the same concept as boiling point. The less volatile, volatile means it uh, vaporizes and converts into a gas without actually having to add heat to it. Um, it also determines its reactivity as well. Lower the vapor pressure, right? Those molecules are uh, very, very stable. They're attracted to one another if they have high intermolecular forces, so it's less likely to become a vapor and put pressure on a container. And they also have greater surface tension. And we've talked a little bit about water bugs and how they can stand on the water. But if you put them in a nonpolar substance, they'll actually sink to the bottom. That's because the intermolecular forces are high at the surface. So those water bugs can actually move across it. Okay? So lots of different properties that we can look at due to the intermolecular forces that are present within a substance. Lots of information today. I know this is a jam-packed video. Luckily, this is the only video for this unit, so we'll spend quite a bit of time going through and reviewing this, and we will see you next time, guys. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your attention. Hope you have a great day, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.